will be a very good clue to, to the, the, our participants. And now is the time for you to, to make questions. I can see that there are some people moving around there. So, please, who is going to be the first? Example of broader, broader cooperation is uh, municipality of Stream and for oil. Why? Because uh, the uh, city has a, a new open center of cross border cooperation. It's not on the level of the municipality, it's the level of the government. Because all, both governments it's involved in that. In the second way, um, people are not using the funds. Uh, maybe use more forms of the European Union to work on the board. Why? Because of, especially um, uh, for people I not need so so forms. Because I have the excellent business cooperation with excellent ne own neighbors, Greece. Because um, yes, um, the people I have the best cooperation, business cooperation in all these parts of Macedonia. And the second one. And my, my question for you about why do you have the, any information on the source, how many of the, of the funds of, Europe, of European funds are uh, still uh, used, and do you know for what uh, the student municipality use the funds? And um, this is my question. And, and for you, we are not here also. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for the question and the remarks. Okay, um, about the Bitola uh, uh, involvement in the cross-border activities, uh, as I said, I was focused on the... I started my work thinking, comparing this EU region, but as, you, as I said, there are no EU region, even in Bitola. Uh, so, uh, I focus uh, the research on the municipal, municipal uh, offices working on CBC because, as you know, your region are uh, based on the, uh, new, the creation of new entity where municipalities are involved. They create new association that could have a legal status in terms of pu public legal status or private legal status. Now we have European Group with territorial cooperation, as you know. So I focus uh, the activity of municipalities in terms of CBC uh, activities. And uh, speaking with different uh, officers there, they said they're working within uh, these CBC activities using EU funds. The good point of Vitola was that they created a specific agency which is called, if I remember right, Pelagonia uh, Development Agency or something similar and it was really useful because uh, it was a new entity uh, focused exactly on CBC activities specifically also involving economic actors. So this was something uh, unique, let's say, that was comparable to the Rusa, Rusa environment, so in between uh, Romania and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Hungaria, and they have also a new region working on CBC activities. So this was, uh, let's say, the contest of Vitola, which was a good example. But also Kriva Palanka, they are really active uh, with speaking about Macedonia with CBC activities. Mm -hmm. What, I, what, what I, I, I tried to point out was that uh, uh, there is no uh, a real involvement of um, economic actors, at least. They were interested in that. They have a good inclination in this kind of exchange, this kind of uh, uh, potential business in the neighborhoods. But of course, there are even technical and pragmatical problems in terms of visa, in terms of taxation, and blah blah. blah. And uh, they could not be involved in uh, EU funds projects because they have uh, they are not no profit association. Uh, about Struga, still, I, as I said, uh, I focused on the EU offices. So there, there were six people working on that. But they told me that uh, they got two uh, projects with Greek partners, 
but no one with with uh, with Albania and uh, something which is interesting uh, with the case of uh, Macedonian Firo as you want uh, okay but you know this is the point of cross border cooperation and history you know we have I think I'm uh, the Italian point of view of that we are not uh, you know I I felt in my field work sometimes that we are, in some cases, we are starting, our starting point is a bit different. No? Speaking with engineer, Albanian engineer, uh, sometimes they started speaking about history and how Okrit was part of their empire. With Bulgarian, sometimes they speak how Bulgarian, in the first empire, they had two different uh, uh, sea coast, so the, the Bialo More and the, and the Cerno More, so you know, it's important. I, I, I remember from, from yesterday, it's, it's, it's loaded here now. Uh, we have a session coming up and uh, we are missing two speakers, Mr. Ivan Obradovic was told that he left already and also Mr. Larissa Tosic. But uh, it doesn't by any means uh, diminish the value of, of the topic we have here, especially when we are now in Serbia, which is in the accession process in the EU. We had a quite good uh, discussion about uh, the cross border cooperation, and uh, to my opinion, uh, many values which are which are considered to be promoting good cross border cooperation are also promoting the enlargement process because basically you are you are um, working with uh, your neighbors also when you are trying. Community of your neighbors. The, the European Union doesn't doesn't tend to to enlarge in, in this kind of countries which are not uh, border members. It's, it's, uh, the process is going so that uh, the preference is is uh, in the neighboring countries of, of EU. Uh, my task for Western borders has worked now uh, for a little bit over seven years and uh, if during this time uh, the map of external borders has changed already a couple of times even so uh, suddenly those uh, areas where we have had uh, external border cooperation have become uh, internal border that this was the situation, for example, uh, with uh, the regional uh, previous speaker, uh, Melita Richter, who, who comes from Free uh, Women And some of the photos actually are there, there from that region. Uh, we have three summer, youth summer seminars there. And uh, it was a time when, uh, when it was not so long ago. Uh, Slovenia was uh, the Slovenian border was external border, and uh, that time uh, Croatian border was still the uh, are matching the nationality doesn't doesn't uh, influence that much, and, and if the language is everybody knows, for example, English language are real. like here we are working with English, so we can work in an understandable way. And then suddenly we find, find, find this uh, if, if the national government, for example, would think about this. You, they would never believe that uh, this couple, for example, might dance together in, in an uh, evening happening in a wine yard <laughs> in Italy or so. Many, many uh, nice memories from, from uh, this kind of events. Okay. But uh, this was not so scientific uh, uh, privilege, so uh, maybe Anna Mikolo might continue with the uh, uh, aspect of, of this European peace and 
middle of the night, uh, like in this case, in the university. Mm -hmm. uh, I will not have an introduction now because later on I will have a presentation and speak then, so uh, I will just go directly to Ms. Vera Mutangel, so uh, the floor is yours to so have a presentation. Thank you, I think you for the invitation to be here. Um, my name is Prada Kandia, I'm a PhD candidate in second year at the University of Bucharest, and I'm um, the assistant there. I am I'm a foreign affairs advisor to the Romanian Senate. Um, I chose for uh, this um, forum today the uh, topic of the impact of the Ukrainian crisis, not only because I hope it would uh, of bringing forward very new and interesting discussions, but also because I believe in the long-term effects that the Ukrainian crisis will have on all European generations that are to uh, continue their uh, growth within uh, the uh, European Union. Um, this is a very interesting idea to expand on. But as I was reading my abstract here, I saw that I was very politically correct to name uh, this conflict as the Ukrainian crisis. But I will continue with this forum to refer to it as the war in Ukraine. Because there is a war happening in Ukraine and we are all ignoring the fact when we employ and try to be very diplomatic the fact that there are people dying there, and we have to take this into consideration. I'm also referring to war in the Ukraine, because especially here in the Western Balkans, I believe there is a need to refer to things in a similar perspective and try to have a dialogue on issues that are that prone cooperation and not only um, to very big differences among the people or the nations who have had scars in their past. Uh, the uh, problem that I would like to, to bring forward also by referring to the idea of war <coughs> is that in this situation, the process of EU enlargement, is that the situation in Ukraine has unfortunately brought forth a lot of rhetoric on behalf of old traditional democracies, let's say, in the uh, European Union. Which have, which can keep, who continue to show a certain level of uh, disappointment, let's say, with the um, uh, process or the evolution of the countries who are candidates to join the European Union. And they continue to use this crisis not only to excuse the fact that they have been caught on the wrong foot without having the instruments to try to deal with such a crisis, but also to take steps back from the process of new enlargement. This happens right now, I believe, because the EU throughout the years and also as a result of the European crisis, of the uh, economic crisis, has lost the um, initial mission statement that it had. And that was to create the EU and join economies in order to make war materially impossible. This was in the Schuman Declaration. Throughout the years, the EU member states have used economy not as an instrument to create peace, but the economic dimension as a goal in itself. And right now we continue to see that EU member states withdraw within their borders and try to solve their economic problems and continue economic prosperity of the EU without taking into consideration that the main goal of the EU was to further peace and make war impossible on all lands. From this point forward, I think that we have to stress as much as we can by being not just young people who are involved somehow in supporting um, EU solidarity and EU core values, which are democratic state building, free market, human rights, and rule of law, and take real responsibility in reminding all the EU leaders right now that without a visionary and courageous perspective on and coherent foreign policy, this amazing instrument that was put forward more than 50 years ago will lose an important aspect of its mission statement. As we continue to look to all the states that are undergoing at different levels, 
their um, accession process, be it in the Western Balkans, be it the states in the Eastern Partnership, we see that there is increasingly more need of the EU presence at all levels of the society in such states. As I started this presentation and mentioned that we should refer to the crisis in the Ukraine as to a situation of war, I also thought that when um, the EU has to present itself at the level of the society, it should be as a response to the Russian presence that exists in such states, such as the Ukraine or the Republic of Moldova, which is not visible, but it is there, while the EU does not perform as well. And the conditionality of the EU towards the population of such countries has to be credible that after you meet a certain level of, um, of portion of the conditionality, something will happen for your society. In none of these countries, if the EU enlargement process doesn't become credible for the society, no reform can actually take place. And I think this is also the situation in Serbia. Um, I continue to think that I am quite fortunate, and we are quite fortunate for most of Europe to have lived at our age in a time where we have not met war on our lands. And I hope this will continue to be so. But for this, the EU has to reconsider its initial mission. And in this direction, I mentioned, of course, the need for more presence in such states where there are some problems, not necessarily visible, but which erupt, like we've seen in the Ukraine, through uh, becoming a soft power indeed, through education, through every single known instrument that we have already employed. And secondly, there is the uh, historical mission that the EU is undergoing now, which is the trade agreement with the United States that gives us all the huge opportunity to redefine our economic relations, not only with the EU and the United States, but also in reference to the Russian Federation. So, thank you so much. Um, I hope I have given some food for thought and I look forward to some debates. Thank you.
stability and the peace in the world. Of course, enlargement is goal of practically all Balkan countries. Uh, some have succeeded, like Slovenia, Croatia, yet of course on the other side Romania and Bulgaria, but some are still so-called black, black holes in the world. And when we speak about enlargement, speaking strictly physically, this is not enlargement, because we are surrounded by European Union countries. Uh, Enlargement can be toward Moldavia or Ukraine or something like that, but uh, this is finishing the process of European integration in Europe. And it has enormous impact on our politicians. Uh, of course, they are aware that this is perhaps the only big idea they can promise to their people. Why? Because of all of us in, who are now in the process of integration or accession, have enormous social problems, economic, first of all, but also the others. And I think that our politicians understand there is no other way to solve these problems but through integrating into European Union. Also, they have been aware of the values of the European Union. And of course, as mentioned just before, uh, making war impossible is one of the main goals of the European Union. So there is no chance to have a region like this here with conflicts, instability, and perhaps new wars or new, new severe conflicts which will destabilize the European Union. And at the same time, to try to be a member to, to such an organization. But after making to you also a question, do you think that it is really a goal of our politician I have to give you just one example. Ten days ago, it was a football match in Belgrade between Serbia and Armenia. And a serious incident happened with, on both sides, some provoked. I will not blame anyone because of that, but it happened and it was very serious. Unfortunately, only few hours after this incident, politicians on both sides started giving very, very serious statements with perhaps, in my opinion, serious, possible serious consequences. And it was enough that Frau Merkel made a phone call to two prime ministers that politicians in both countries changed their views and after that started speaking softly. It is an excellent example, in my opinion, how our politicians have some kind of fear or respect toward leaders of the European Union. And it's not important whether that was Frau Merkel or Baroness Ashton or Monsieur Juncker, Van Führer or some others. It is important that it has come from within the European Union and they know that not respecting such opinion is absolutely unacceptable for their countries and their prospects for European integration. But on the other side, and this is the second issue I would stress, there is an enormous problem on stability as part of this system. Peace is, in my opinion, ensured for a certain time. I don't think that there is any kind of possible conflict, open conflict or war between our nations, states in the Balkans. But what's with development? Because peace alone is very fragile. If there is no development, if there is no social economic security, how will people of the Balkans support such a concept? I belong to those notorious so-called Balkan optimists. Do you know the difference between pessimists and optimists in the Balkans? You don't. When they speak about situation in their countries, then pessimists say situation is so bad that it cannot be worse. And the optimists reply immediately, yes, it can be, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, you heard yesterday, you, heard, you have heard today some data on very bad economic and social situation and even mental health situation in our countries. If we have such a problem, 
There's enormous difficult uh, unemployment rate. 50% was mentioned yesterday in some countries. How can we expect that those people can support such a process in which they feel as victims? We very often hear about so-called enlargement fatigue, an attitude of public opinion in European member countries, with a lot of suspect, if not rejection, of idea of further enlargement. I have served for four years in Germany as Serbian ambassador. I had the opportunity to meet German officials, but also German common citizen. And I can witness that something like uh, a fatigue really exists. Uh, it's present, not only in Germany, in many European countries. But on the other side, in the Balkan countries, we have something that I would like to call transition fatigue. It lasts so long, practically more than 20 years, and we have no real positive result up to date so far. In most of our countries, hopes, expectations of the peoples were perhaps too high. We have thought that our problems could be solved much faster and better as they have been so far. And such a very serious economic situation threatens stability of some of the countries in the region. I dare to say that even in Serbia, the situation is not so prosperous as we would like to see, that we have a lot of problems, economic problems first of all, and of course the most important problem of unemployment. But in the other countries, the situation is not much better, if not some of them worse than here. Because of that, it looks to me that there is some kind of mutual disappointment or mutual unfulfilled expectations on the side of the European Union because they would like to see much more responsible politicians, more diligent people here, more results, faster and better reforms than we have done so far. But on the other side, there is a kind of disappointment by our citizens of, of their expectations, especially because most of them think that there is a kind of fear by the people of the EU members that we can make only troubles to them, that we cannot benefit integrating the European Union, that we will only cost. And because of that, some or part of our people tend to believe that there is a kind of conditionality policy which is not favorable toward us, which is intentionally done to not to make us ready for European Union by putting new and new conditions after we have fulfilled some existing. I would like to hear your opinion. Do you think that this is prevailing opinion in our societies, or we still have positive opinion of most of the citizens? Unfortunately, polls in Serbia, which have been done by our Office of European Integration, regularly, uh, water, which means each three months, uh, now for 12 or 13 years, show that we have really lower and lower percentage of population supporting EU enlargement idea for integration of Serbia in your opinion. Of course, we have a very specific reason for that. It is a Kosovo issue. But I have looked on the data from other countries around us, and it is a very similar situation. My origin is from Croatia, from their nation. And I was asking my relatives, my friends there, how they feel after they entered the European Union. It is also a kind of disappointment. It is also a kind of disappointment of Slovenia. And I'm afraid that uh, these moves of public opinion are not just an accident, that it has some roots and that on both sides, by our politicians, by us, and when I say by us, I think those who are pro-European oriented and uh, have been active in this support of the European Union, 
Personally, I, I was the vice president of European Movement in Serbia for four years. But as I understand, most of you have been activists in such a sense. Have a chance to prevail, or those who have become skeptic or pessimistic will prevail in the future. And the third problem I have seen, and I would like to share my attitude with you and to listen to your opinion, is issue of young generation. I'm afraid that in all Balkan countries we have a situation that youth can be, has been divided in three groups. One small group of pro-European activists like you, one unfortunately bigger group of political extremists, different not only right, right wing but different kind of extremists in our region, especially for those who are chauvinists, and I do not agree with the famous joke on the definition of chauvinists in the Balkans. Those of us who hate them or the others more than it. This is of course a more than it. We have a lot of fanatics, unfortunately also among young people, and we witness for several years that there are different groups from those who have, I dare to say, hot heads to those who make a move with the hand, not trying to demonstrate how tall a corp has grown, has grown in their country. These groups are unfortunately very militant, and because of that, sometimes we have the impression that they prevail in society. In my opinion, the most numbered group is so-called silent majority. The majority of young generations have no interest in political activity or even broader to say social activities, including this one or something like this one. And they try to enjoy the life in a situation without many prospects or good prospects for them. Especially in this region we have a terrible problem of brain drain young, well-educated people going abroad. I don't know whether you know this fact, but Serbia has so many highly qualified people abroad as in the country. 12%. Because of that we make a joke how clever Serbians speak with Tami Serbia by phone from, from abroad. It's a terrible, terrible situation I don't think that anything worse can happen to a society than the brightest young men leave society to live anywhere but not in their country. Middle East, Afghanistan, now Ukraine. And because of that, the Balkan is not so actual or, or so important for most of the European politicians. I am afraid that we have perhaps lost our chance a few years ago when there was an attention of the European Union focused on, on our region and our countries. But now, with all these new problems, I'm not sure they can change the attitude so quickly and so seriously I expect that is needed and that because of that we can witness some instabilities perhaps not worse, not serious conflict, but serious internal instabilities in the Balkan countries. I think that my time has been expired, and I hope that you will be ready to continue this by questions I put or your opinion on this issue. Thank you very much.